If you were given the chance to know that you are carrying the genetic marker for a fatal disease or life-altering illness, would you want to know? Science has given us the possibility of peering into our genes, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we're equipped to handle that information. Here now to help us examine the risks and rewards of cracking our code. In New York, New York, Laura Hersher, instructor of genetics counseling at the Joan H. Marks Human Genetics Program at Sarah Lawrence College. And with us back here in studio, Dr. Stephen Scherer, director of the Center for Applied Genomics at the Hospital for Sick Children here in Toronto. Dr. Carrie Bowman, bioethicist at the Joint Center for Bioethics at the University of Toronto. Bev Heim Myers, CEO and Executive Director of the Huntington Society of Canada, and Carolyn Abraham, author of the upcoming book, The Juggler's Children, A Journey into Family, Legend, and the Genes That Bind Us. That's a good title. Thank That's you. a really good. Did you think of that title? All by myself. Good one. Nice job. Nice job. Uh, good to have everybody here in the studio. Laura Hersher, thanks for being there on the line from New York City for us. Stephen, let me get you in off the top here. You're asking Canadians, I think, to have their genomes sequenced and to share that information publicly as part of this personal genome project that you're involved with. Uh, why do you want us to do that? Well, maybe just to begin, there's a new medical technology that's become available that's called genome sequencing that allows us to determine the complete DNA sequence of all the chemical bases of the DNA and all the cells of your body. Uh, and this is a technology that we're now using for disease studies. Uh, but we think it's going to become a standard diagnostic test in hospitals in, in the very near future. So this personal genome project, and we have a Canadian uh, version of it now, uh, was really set up to study all aspects of how this new genome sequencing technology would impact the general society, so the, the general population that's actually healthy now. So what type of information would it deliver with respect to the predictive nature of the genetic uh, variants that are being detected? So we set up this project to study the consents, the ethics, who should be enrolled in these types of studies, the technology itself, how to generate the sequence, how to make sense of the information, how to deliver it back to families or not, and how it's going to impact the medical and the entire social health care system. Just a small little <laughs> modest project, right? Well, it, it's, it's a research project. It's a, it's a way to get our, our feet wet in a way, to start to um, try to discover what the questions are that we don't know about yet. Terry Bowman, good idea? Yeah, I, I mean, mostly, I, you know, I think down the road it's going to be enormously beneficial to a lot of people. So why only mostly? Well, because there's so much we just don't know at this point. We, there's so much, we, the unknowns are so huge that, you know, from an ethical point of view, to consent for something like this is just so tricky. Because normally with consent you need to know how is the information going to be used, who's going to use it, where is it going to be stored, how long is it going to be stored for, what are the limits, we can't really answer a lot of those questions with something of this nature. Uh, but having said that, what does one do? Because these are such early days, but very problematic from a consent point of view to figure out how to do this ethically. Bev, what's your issue with this? <clears throat> I think from a health and a research perspective, it's, it's just the top of the iceberg. And I think it's very, very exciting. And I think it's something that we need to move forward with. In Canada, we're not protected. So in Canada, when we disclose our genetic information, we can be discriminated against it. So that's a concern for me. Discriminated how? If somebody, based on their, their genetic makeup, so based on their genetic information. So now in Canada, if your genetic information, insurance companies and employers can ask for that genetic information. So it's not just used for health and research purposes. So to Terry's point with the consent, what are you consenting to? And if I put my genome out there for generations to come, will my, my descendants be impacted by my genome being on, uh, on the web for everybody to so see? So that's a concern for it's you? It's a concern, but what's not a concern is that this is exciting research, and this is the beginning of what could help for treatments, what could help for preventative measures for disease. So it's something we need to move forward with, but we need to protect the citizen first. Laura Hersher, what's your view of this? Oh, well, it's very exciting. I think it's wonderful. I am I would agree with the issues about consent, but to be honest, for me, um, the question of what we can do with this, you know, the, the finding out too much information is somewhat dwarfed by the what we can't do with this. Like, there's just so much information that get back that we don't really know what it means. 
And I think in some ways that's a trickier problem. Hmm. Carolyn Abraham, as you weigh the pros and cons, what do you find? Well, I think this is um, a classic example of, of science outpacing policy, outpacing uh, our sort of collective ability to grapple with the social implications of something new. Um, I guess somewhere in the order of 90% plus of the genome is yet to be understood. The individual on his or her own might have very little to gain, but there could be an enormous amount as, you know, as a whole society um, that could be of great benefit to participate in this research. The risks are enormous. In Canada, we are, we're just not there in terms of formulating protections because no one, I think, realized how quickly this was going to be coming to the clinic. And it is coming much more quickly than anybody ever imagined. I mean, the pace of technology, as with so much in the information age, it's like the internet itself. It went from nothing to everything in a snap. And that's going to happen here. And I think that this project seems to me very much um, an attempt to jumpstart the conversation, um, the discussion at a political level, at a social level. And um, I don't think we could really uh, miss this boat. That's not saying that Aunt, nobody's being compelled to participate. It's still a matter of personal choice. So those are my feelings on it. <laughs> Equal time for the doc from Sick Kids to respond to all of what he's heard. Well, just to remind everyone that the Canadian Personal Genome Project uh, has been something we've been formulating since 2007, actually. So we've thought long and hard, perhaps too long and hard, about all of these questions. Uh, and in fact, we we modeled our consents after the U.S. sister project uh, led by a Harvard group, by George Church's uh, group. And, and the idea was to actually um, include all of these questions in the consents. So the people who are enrolling in this part of the research study actually are fully educated by a genetic counselor and an ethicist on these questions. They have to go through an examination actually to, uh, to show that they understand basic genetics. They have to answer questions that they, their family, for example, can understand what's going to happen with the full data release. So we tried to think through as many of the questions as possible. Uh, we're probably missing some. I, this is part of the project. We're going to learn. But they have to sign this. And then, and then the, I think the real different part of this is, in fact, the genome sequence will be released publicly on the internet. And the, the idea behind that is, is by putting it out there, we'll have uh, control information we can use in all kinds of other genetic studies. And other people who may be look at, looking at the data from a different perspective may see things that we don't see. Let me get Laura to f uh, just uh, give us some feedback on, on one of the angles that you just raised there. You're a genetics counselor instructor, and this is all pretty state-of-the-art stuff that we're talking about tonight. And I wonder whether even after people have been counseled on what the ethical, et cetera, ramifications of all this are, do they still potentially not understand it all? Well, I mean, of course. Of course you can't understand it all because, uh, as you were just saying, we don't know. We don't know exactly what we're going to find, and we don't always know the significance of it. But I've actually gone through that consent process for uh, the PGP here in, in the United States. It's very thorough. It tries very hard to be complete. Um, and I think it, it does communicate the limitations that we have. Um, I think the people that are involved in this very particular project do mainly understand what's at stake, and they are excited to, to be involved, which is, which is great. It is very exciting. Um, I think trying to use it in clinical setting is really quite different. Um, Follow up by what you mean by that. So, well, I mean, you have to differentiate between things that are being used by uh, interested, intellectually motivated, um, curious people who, who, who want to be involved in this and who are sort of motivated about the whole thing, who want to learn, and, so, and somebody who is trying to get information in, this, in a medical setting and, um, you know, may not be interested in, or, or, or may not desire to have all this other information, but it's going to get sort of thrust at them. Gotcha. So okay. there's different settings. Gotcha. How, how many people involved in the Canadian project so far? Well, we've, we've had over 600 people contact us um, to enroll in the project, and we've started already now about 10 individuals in the personal genome project. But what I wanted to really clarify is that 
this is a research project to understand how the information is going to impact uh, the general public as a whole. But I think it's very important that people understand that, in fact, earlier versions of the genome sequence test, kind of a lower resolution test, is performed every day in hospitals across Canada and the United States at the Hospital for Sick Children. We do over 4,000 uh, what we call microarray scans per year. This is a lower resolution test of genome sequencing, but it's genomic information. And so there is this change going from looking at one gene at a time to the entire set of genes or the genome. And along with that, you get lots of additional information that may provide some insight or not into other medical disorders you may or may not develop. So that's really the, the question at hand here is what do we do with all this other information? How do we make sense of it? Speaking of information, I want to just, I don't think you'll mind if I throw a little plug in here for the work you did for the Globe's website back in December. The DNA Dilemma, that was your series, which is still up on the Globe's website and it's very good, very good work. Uh, you asked people whether they would have their genome sequenced and whether they would share their genetic information with the public. And here's the results. 80% said they would sequence their genome and 70% said the benefits to science and research would outweigh I guess some of the risks that we're talking about here. And Carolyn, after it's all said and done, what do you infer from those numbers and perhaps some of the other public opinion you learned? Well, I have to say I was surprised. I was surprised that the overwhelming majority of people who responded said they would jump in and they would do this, that they thought that the risks would be worth it if they could contribute in this way. But a theme that keeps coming up about consent and what people want to know um, is, is, I think, there's a real conflict, I think, going on with genomics and sort of this sense of who should be the gatekeepers of information. It's happening everywhere um, in all mass media, and I think it's happening very much so in science now as well, where it used to be, you know, the doctor would tell you what he thought you ought to know or she thought you ought to know about a particular test result and wouldn't give you um, an answer if the answer was fuzzy or they couldn't explain it well themselves. And I think focus groups, from what I understand, are now coming back um, specifically on the question of genetics. And people are saying, we understand that you don't know. We understand that this is ambiguous. We just want to know. And we want to be able to decide for ourselves whether or what we do with this incomplete, fuzzy information. And I think in one of the interesting aspects of the consent form for the Personal Genome Project is it does say this, that what you might learn here is incomplete, and what you might learn here could actually turn out to be true one day, but not true the next. Hmm. Um, and it, it's all very much a moving target, and do you want to jump into that kind of ambiguity? And where maybe the old gatekeepers would say, no, we, we shouldn't, we shouldn't you know, parse that out, uh, that should be, you know, kept from people are saying, no, let us in, L let us in as the knowledge evolves. I want to see how far you folks want to be let into this. You are all people who deal with this. Okay, so let's go around the table here. Bev, would you want your genome sequenced and would you want to know? Not right now. You don't Not, want to know. Well, I, I would like to know in time when we have protection in Canada. And, and to the point, I think a lot of people are willing to jump in, but I'm not sure that they understand the full risk of it. 91%, this was a poll done by the uh, federal government, 91% of the people feel that genome information should be used for research and health, but not for business decisions. So insurance decisions and uh, employment decisions. So truly public opinion is much different than what can actually happen and what people are are putting forward. I'm, I'm not sure people truly understand. I think people think that they cannot be discriminated against. So it's, it's very low on so, the totem pole. So you're a no for now. Stephen? Well, mine's done already. But what I want to point out is, is mine's not on the internet yet. <laughs> um, Would you object uh, if it were? Well, I'm still thinking about it. It's not, I haven't had time to do it, to be honest. Uh, but uh, um, again, this is part of the, pro the, the, the role of having this project, is, is to figure this out. Um, but what I wanted to say is just to make it really clear that when we're doing these genetic experiments in, in the, the testing and things in the hospitals, that's not put on the internet. I mean, this is protected information. <laughs> so, um, so, so we I really we have to. Heard that from yeah. So we, just to make that really clear. Did you learn anything from your uh, readout? Yeah. I mean, you know, I've, I've found that I've inherited some very interesting genetic variants that were quite surprising. That uh, you know, I found some large deletions of, of segments of my DNA that we all have. We look at any of your DNA, you'll find these things, these copy number variants that our laboratory helped discover in 2004.
but uh, I found um, in particular one segment of my DNA <clears throat> that is missing a big chunk of a lot of genes, and that was kind of surprising to me. What does that mean, though? Uh, it means that I'm a mutant like everyone else in, in the population. And in fact, <laughs> this is really, I think, the beauty of, 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 of the study of genetics is that it shows us we all have genetic alterations and mutations and variations, depending on the terminology used. Uh, we're not perfect, but it's what makes us who we are. And that's what we're trying to really understand, what information is most relevant to making medical decisions for families who have very specific questions of you know, what's going to impact them in the future. Mm -hmm. Laura, let's go to you in New York. Would you want to have your genome sequenced if you haven't done it already? I haven't done it already. I've, I've sort of a, one of these lesser scans, but I haven't done the full sequence. Um, I would be perfectly happy to um, because I think it would be a good thing. You know, in that spirit of I'd like to contribute, and really we can't make use of the data without lots and lots of information on healthy people. If we only get information on sick people, we're going to have a bias in terms of what we find out. Mm -hmm. we're, we're not going to know if, you know, like you were just saying, Steve, that, that you have these deletions that turns out you're, you know, you're obviously fine. I, I think you're functioning, you know. It's a, um, it, it, if we don't get that sort of information, we can't make use of the rest of it. So I'd be happy to contribute. I have to say I, I would have limited expectations for how useful it would be to me right now. Gotcha. Carrie? I wouldn't. Um, and that's a personal decision. I mean, I, I certainly understand what Laura is saying, and I agree. I mean, from a point of view of altruism, we need large amounts of information, and not just genomic mapping. We need personal information about disease profiles and health and well-being. I mean, that's how epidemiology, study of health and illness in society work. But it's the uncertainty. I don't worry so much about insurance and this and that. I, I would worry more about the ambiguity of just not being able to make sense of what it is saying. There might be a tendency here. We see it in the genotype. We don't know if that would affect you in, you know, in, in your day-to-day -day life. And these are early days, but I, I'm not convinced anything is more personal, actually, than your than your DNA and your genome. If there's something more personal than that, I can't think of what it is. Do you think there's some argument that could come along in the next year or two that might make you persuadable the other way? Yes. For, I, I do. Maybe not year or two. I, I think... Longer down the road. Yeah. Can you imagine what that argument might be? Well, I mean, I, if I was to hear more about the, the incredible social contribution that it's making, mm -hmm. I would be persuaded. Um, but I must say, you know, this is not the biggest ethical problem within society is understanding our genome. If you want to look at the world's greatest ethical challenges, they're mostly access to health care and well-being, which we're very much not interested in. Um, so, you know, it's not as if this is the way to make the world a better place. It's one of the ways, but it's probably not the most pressing. I feel technology is pushing us into this, uh, and I work on the front lines, and I feel very pushed by this. Um, and barely ready. Because the technology is moving faster than our ability to then understand Then I'm it. able to deal with it. Then you're yeah. able to deal with it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> to speak selfishly, yeah. <laughs> OK. Mm. Carolyn, well, we know you did it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, but there's a caveat. Um, What's the caveat? It was, it was I, I looked at my genes and my family's genome to look back. <laughs> um, and I uh, was very deliberate in not looking at the genome to look forward. Mm. I did, I, it was a condition of my mother's participation in, in my project was that um, we not find out about future health risks. She was, um, you know, happy to look at our DNA to tell us something about our ancestry. But, um, and, and I understand that. And I'm actually thinking through um, Right now, would I would I do this? Would I would I join PGP? Um, because I know my personality, and um, I err on the side of worrying. And uh, peace of mind uh, <laughs> is a valuable thing to me. But and you're a medical reporter, and you can imagine the contribution that that yes. information might make. So so how about you know if I contributed, but you don't tell me what? It, well, <laughs> you can have my DNA, but I don't want to know you what don't it want says. To know. Yeah, I could see something like that, really? unless there was something medically actionable. Otherwise, I, I think I would, would err on the side of, of you know, contributing, but, but not being. I, I just can't see, you know, annotating myself and, and finding out and the uncertainty of what something may or may not mean. Can I just hit this on the head? You don't yeah. want to know because you're afraid you might find out you're going to have something 
that is untreatable. And what's the point? Is that it? Um, I think so. I think that's part of it. And I, th and I think it also then would make me worry for my kids. Mm -hmm. And I would worry if I have this um, quirk or, or blip that may result in, in an adverse health event that do my children have it? And there are some people who really want to know all of that kind of information. And I don't know that I'm that kind of person. Mm -hmm. I, I know that I'm the kind of person who would want to know something she could do something about. Right. But if you can't, but if I can't. Which takes me to Bev. Mm -hmm. Right after this program is over, both as you, if you're watching it at 8 o'clock and if you're watching it at 11 o'clock, right after this program is over, uh, we're going to air a documentary called Do You Really Want to Know? Which focuses on something you know lots about, and that's the Huntington's gene, and whether those with a family history want to be tested for it. Uh, the cost of getting this done, aside from the project, is going to drop. And this presumably will be something more people will be interested in the future, and with lower prices will come greater accessibility to this information. Question, how much do we really want to know about what's in our genes? I think it's very important when it comes to a disease like Huntington disease to know. And when we go forward for clinical trials, for many of the diseases, you're going to want to know if you want to participate in a clinical trial because it's disease specific and treatment specific. So I, I think in, in some cases it's very important to know, but it's a very personal decision and it's, it's a very private, personal information to know. And if you want to know, you have to know that that information is being protected. So I, I think it is important to know in many cases, but you also need to know that that is your information and it's, it's not to be shared with the world or be used for purposes that you don't want it used for. If you were to scan yourself and if you were to find out that you do carry the genetic marker for Huntington's disease, which is fatal and is a miserable way to go, would you want to know? I think in some cases people do want to know. When you talk to people, they say, I do want to know because I want to know how to live the rest of my life. When you talk to people, they say, I don't want to know because I want to live the rest of my life. So it's a very personal decision. Some want to, and in that documentary that you're going to see, it profiles three families that have had different approaches to wanting to know their genetic status. One family who didn't want to know and choose not to. One family that has absolutely buried themselves in the research and moved forward and made significant impact in research going forward. And another family who stays, thrives, and believes that, that he is still very well. And in every day, he doesn't believe he's sick. He lives his best life. So I think you have to look at it. Can I still lead my best life and live my best life knowing the information? And is it going to cripple me by knowing that information? Or is it actually going to add value to how I can live my life? Could you weigh in on some of this stuff, Carrie? how people would weigh the, the different risks and choices by either knowing or not knowing? Well, I mean, people have as much of a right to not know as they have a right to know. And what I worry with a lot of this is there's a bit of a thrust. You know, within Western culture, there is kind of a belief system that, you know, the truth will set you free and get out there and, you know, especially in, in recent years to go on television or whatever. And, 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 I, and I feel that this is getting sort of rolled into that and let's go public on this because it's a good thing. But people absolutely have a right not to know. And, and I have actually seen, as you have too, some pretty catastrophic results when, in fact, people have received information that other people thought was a good idea that they should know. For example? Huntington's. Well, can, I mean, tell, tell us a story. Well, what have you heard? I mean, you can have very negative reactions. You can have a lot of depression. You can have, you know, people not functioning well because sometimes other people think this is something you should do. And I think when we, when, whenever we counsel people, patients, we need to stress the personal element of this. And I worry a lot of times within ourselves, our starting point is you're better off knowing whether we articulate it or not, it is communicated. And I, I worry we push people sometimes into things they're not ready for. They feel they should do this and somehow it's gonna feel better. And I'm not convinced that's always true for It doesn't everybody. always feel better. No. Can I just make a sure. comment? I, I think um, uh, two key words were used. One is personal, personal, personal information, altruistic. Um, and I think you need to think about this as a technology that gives you information with respect to your family history. And when we talk about genetics, genetic counseling, clinical genetics, that's the most important information. That's the question that your doctor should ask you the first minute you walk in his, his or her office is, do you have a family history for this or that? And this information will add 
to that data as it gets more and more informative when you compare it to clinical records. So uh, I think you can think of it that from that perspective. So in fact, you get your personal genome, but it's a reflection of your family and your and the human history, right? 50% of your genes come from each of your parents. So it does add in a whole other level of ethical questions around that. Mm -hmm. uh, just to point out in the PGP consents, we've addressed at least some of that. Yeah. But um, uh, by definition, genetic is personal, but it's also familial. Yeah. PGP, if you tune in late, is the uh, personal genome project that is happening both in the United States, and you're in charge of the, are you in charge of, or? Yeah? yeah, I guess so, yes. Can I call you the boss of it? <laughs> of the Canadian the, project. The point of distinction, and, and I think we all numbers. realize this, <laughs> yeah. Huntington's is a single gene mutation, and when we speak about genomics in general, we're often not at all talking about single gene mutations. So Huntington's is something definitive that you can, we see it, it's there, your chances are 50-50. As we speak about genome mapping and microarray, many of these things are absolutely not clear as to what they would mean in your own life. Laura, can I get you to come in here and, and just let's take the conversation beyond Huntington's. What other kind of information can you get uh, or can someone learn by having their genome sequenced? Well, you know, you can, you can set up certain categories and I, I think it is good to take it beyond Huntington's because Huntington's is a, I've worked with those families and it, it's a very wrenching thing. It turns out to be not really like most things in genetics because more things in genetics are complex, raise better questions. There's, there's not much that's so definitive. Um, so you can get information on uh, carrier status. That could have reproductive implications for you, for family members. You can find out about later onset conditions, so things that raise your risk or, or possibly lower your risk for things that might happen in the future. Um, and you can find, you can, you can get information that's essentially diagnostic, something that explains something that's happening in the present, or you can, uh, or you can get information that say, well, s says something about your risk of possibly getting a specific condition like cancer. Um, s some of those pieces of information are very useful. Other ones, I don't know, I think when we start prognosticating about things that might happen in the future, there's a sense that people have that genes are somehow more determinative than other, than other predictors, mm -hmm. and in fact they're not very often. You know, as you were saying, family history is often a, a much better predictor than anything we can pull out of your genes right now. And I do worry that people will overestimate um, what it means to get a prediction if it's from a gene. Because hmm. they're sort of sold on that idea a lot right now, that if it's in the genes, then that's it, you know, that's what's gonna happen. But it's, the relationship between what's in your genes and your health is much more complex than that, and our ability to interpret things predictively is very limited. That is, uh, Carolyn, a, a nicety that is probably lost on most people who have incredible faith in the science these days. Fair to say? Absolutely, I think so. I think most people hear you know, anything with um, uh, sort of the imprimatur of science on it, and they mm -hmm. think it's a certainty uh, one way or the other. But I also think, and not just in terms of sort of genetics as we understand it now, which I think everybody at the table has agreed, there's, I mean, part of the reason this project is going is because there's so much to learn. But also this whole uh, expanding field of epigenetics and mm -hmm. sort of understanding what mm -hmm. role there is uh, Take 20 between seconds to explain what epigenetics uh, is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, what role <laughs> the environment has in shaping the way uh, uh, that script. If DNA is like a script, um, it's a bit like um, how is it read? Who's going to perform it? And and how that script will be read might come out differently depending on the environment in which it's read. So, so it's, it's like tying performance to script and, and trying to understand uh, the impact of, you know, they look at studies, that the things that come to mind are, are often around, you know, babies who were born to mothers who were pregnant during a famine. Mm -hmm. What happens to those babies? What happens to, you know, a genome in the womb when conditions are extreme? 
and and surprisingly it has you know it seems to have very dramatic effects and so if it's if it's that dynamic of a molecule um, what does it say about the way that we live the rest of our lives and it really throws cold water on the idea that genes are destiny because you know it, it might be a guide but that guide could be sort of reshaped by the way you live and and so there's there's a lot of opportunity here I think for people to to get messages that are very mixed and um, mm. but but that's part of the the whole fuzzy Maybe I picture. Just jump in yeah. So, so I think the that was a good description of epigenetics. <laughs> Um, That's why we invited her on. She's good yeah. at this thing. <laughs> I, I think everyone's saying the same thing. The, the genome is a blueprint of its information source, and it's pretty good at, at um, forming the basis of what you or I are going to look like. That's why your siblings look very similar to each other, and you, that's why you look like your mom or your dad. Um, but it is that. It's a blueprint. And what we're trying to do as a, as a community, as scientists, medical professionals, is understand what that information actually means. Uh, and this personal genome project is one component. As was said earlier, most of our studies are looking at specific diseases, looking for specific genes. What we need to do is look at populations of individuals, of the healthy, the healthy population, to see uh, how those gene sequences differ from disease. And typically when we do our research studies, we don't get enough funding to do the controls we need to. And it's just not attractive for the funding agencies. But, so this is one way to fuel research across the board in many different diseases. We're looking at a whole new uh, set of features in the genome because of the actual individuals we're sequencing themselves. So I think it's very, very exciting. It's, it's teaching us a lot about the genome, a lot about genetics, a lot about family history and human history as a whole. Terry, if, we, if, if I understand all this right, genomic sequencing is pretty good at indicating whether or not you're going to get Huntington's disease. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How good is it at telling whether or not you're going to get this kind of cancer, or that kind of cancer, or yet another kind of cancer. Not, not eh? Not. I mean, <clears throat> well, I mean, Stephen would know more than I would, but but not. <laughs> I mean, it, you you can be told that you've got some indicators, or autism. You can be told that there's an indicator, but it it absolutely is not definitive as to whether that's going to translate into that. And you know, what, the, looking at the more positive side, well, if if you find out that, you know, you you have a genetic tilt towards obesity or something, one could argue, so I'm going to eat better and go to the gym more often. But behavior doesn't change very much with, with information, and there's lots of evidence to support that. Really? No, not much, not, not at all. And most of us know what we should be doing and then don't do it, right? So, uh, so there's... But it, most it, of us, uh, hang on, most of us might know it's the right thing to do, mm -hmm. but we don't do it because we figure, oh, there's a 50-50 chance I might not be obese. But if you've got a genetic predisposition towards obesity, that's kind of an extra tool. A couple of early studies have come out that actually suggest not seeing much behavior change when people are told that there's a genetic tilt huh. towards something. Yeah. So, you know, and that's one of the... Steve that, is not sure. Yeah. It's true. There are some. Yeah. There's also some saying that it depends yeah. on the population you, you yeah. survey. But, I mean, you know, the strongest argument from an ethical point of view, and I know I'm going back and forth on this because I'm conflicted like, like many people, is... It can be an act of altruism. I, I think it might be more of an act of altruism for people that haven't been born yet, which is a good thing. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of years before it really pays off, but we need massive amounts of data. <clears throat> and they have to be highly refle reflective of huge amounts of people, uh, you know, healthy, a, a lot of personal information. So um, then you do want people participating in this personal genome project. We need to be cautious. I mean, the obvious thing to do is let's participate but not be identified. But we now know that people can actually be identified. Mm -hmm. There's ways of teasing out sequences that can be linked back to a person, even if their mm -hmm. name is not present. So, you know, these are the things that, that people need to know. But I, I keep coming back to the fact you know, I, I did most of my bioethics training in the 90s, and it's sort of obsolete already because, you know, I was trained in this thing called informed consent. And we can't really do informed consent here because it's no longer informed. You know, the word informed itself, we don't have enough information to inform the person as to what all the parameters are of this. If you're going to have a knee replacement, we can do much better at giving you the parameters of what this means. Can't do that in this case. Stephen, we don't would you know. agree with that? Informed consent is not really as informed as the label suggests? Yes, I would agree with that, but who cares? I mean, the people who are signing up for this project know what they're getting into. They're, they're releasing, as Carolyn put it in the article, the full Monty of genetic information, <laughs> right? But they, they're doing it for altruistic reasons. But I, I think the issue then becomes when the technology is so pervasive that it, 
you know, having your genome sequence is the cost of a, a, a Blackberry or an iPod or whatever, um, uh, that you just have it done. Then, how do we deal with the information, the consenting around it and things like this? And again, that's what we're trying to learn. Um, but uh, uh, it's important to point out that day is almost here. Uh, the price is plummeting fast. We mm -hmm. touched on it earlier. Um, I can give you some statistics. The, the Genome Project cost rough, roughly $3 billion. And when we were involved in Craig Venter's genome sequencing in 2007, uh, that cost was $60 million. A few years ago, it was 50000 for James Watson's sequence. When I was on your show uh, 18 months ago, we are doing sequencing autism genomes from individuals with autism, uh, $4,000, now we're at $2,500. $2,500. Yes, and I, we anticipate the technology mm -hmm. we'll have in our lab by the end of this year will get us in the $1,000 range. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're looking at hours now. So, as uh, opposed to? As opposed to 10 years for the mm -hmm. Genome Project. Uh, mm -hmm. So it, it's going to become um, arguably a point of care diagnostic test at some point in the near future. Bev? And now you can have direct-to-consumer testing. So individuals can go, which is not as extensive as the genome project, but you can you can get your genetic, your genome done for a hundred dollars, which mm -hmm. the sequencing isn't as in depth, but it can be done without regulation. So I think the genome project it's incredibly important, incredibly important moving forward. Done in a clinical setting, the um, chances of it being more accurate are better than people going out mm -hmm. out of curiosity for direct to consumer testing. And let's remove the barriers to doing it. Let's make sure that this is done for research purposes, for medical purposes, and nothing else. Remove the barriers and, mm -hmm. and make it a personal decision. And then go, go ahead and do it. Like it, It's an important thing to be done. And it will give us important answers going forward. All right, but you put a caveat on this. And let me ask Laura about that. Should a doctor or genetic counselor be present any time someone is getting their genome sequenced? Laura, what do you think? Um, well, I think it's unrealistic, unnecessary to say that um, in a regulatory way, like a doctor or a genetic counselor must be present every time. I mean, you are talking about something that's just going to be too easy to do and, and sort of negative. I think the evidence shows, the, the early uh, results of, of studies that they've done show that people really want to have uh, expertise available to them um, for the most part in interpreting genomes. Um, and I, I'm much more interested in seeing if we can make that available and trying to make those resources as available as possible than in um, regulating it. Uh, if a very interested, motivated, curious person wants to get a hold of their genome sequence and see what they can make of it themselves on web-based tools and so on. Uh, you know, great. Um, the fact of the matter is that a lot of the medical people they could find probably can't bring anything more to the table on this particular topic than, than they can if they're willing to put in a lot of research and so on. So, you know, it, I can understand why it gets people annoyed if you say, like, oh, I'm going to mandate having a medical person involved when it's, it's not really going to necessarily add so much value. But I, I would really be interested in making those resources available for people who, who want to have help understanding the information they get back. I think that's extremely important. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, as long oh, as it's yeah, accurate information that they're getting back. Right, right. So I, I think that the regulatory aspect of it is not necessarily having a medical um, geneticist, a medical person present, but the accuracy of the tests that they're getting. So that's where regulation has to come in. Mm -hmm to make sure that it's accurate. Can, can I just add, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I agree completely. I think really to understand this information, you need to uh, now, I mean, it'll get better over time, but you need to have a genetic counselor involved. And I, I wouldn't say any medical professional, and, and you know, most doctors will only get two weeks of genetics in their, in their, under, in their training. So, um, so I think you, you want to have, when I had my genome done, I actually consulted with the counselors at SickKids to look at some of the things because they know some of the information better than, than I do. But I think I just heard Laura say it's unrealistic and unnecessary. You disagree with that? No, no I think she said, she said to have a genetic counselor involved, I thought. Yeah. Well, the question was, should a doctor or genetic counselor be present any time you're doing some genomic sequencing? She said unrealistic and unnecessary. Oh, I would say you would want to have a genetic counselor at hopefully uh, advising you why you should have it done 
and then when you get the data back to help you interpret what it means for you and your family, which is equally important. Hmm. Yeah. But I, I would just say, Steve, uh, the comment this Steve from Sick Kids made is very true. I saw a patient that was facing a serious life-threatening cancer and he went to his family physician who he trusts enormously of, of 20 something years and said look I keep hearing about personalized medicine and genomics its relationship to cancer can you take 10 minutes and explain this to me and the physician said I can't do that because I don't understand it myself and that's pretty common if you were to pull a and lot why, of front why would the doc not understand it him or herself they have not trained in it huh. at all um, at all. Um, there are lots of frontline healthcare workers. If you ask them to explain genomics or sequencing or microarray, would not be able to do it. Um, and it, it's, it simply has not been part of their training. Do remember in the hospitals, there's very, very little of this clinically applied at the bedside, next to nothing. It has not reached that far yet. So we're not seeing it on the front lines yet, with a few exceptions. Karen? And I was going to say, and even um, geneticists who might come across um, something unusual or, or, or potentially uh, worrisome in your DNA, you know, they can give you a, a gene, uh, like the name of a gene, and then you go and you Google it. And then that will bring you to a site that tells you what is known or not known about that gene. And that's what tens of thousands of people are doing. And then they are communing with other people who have that same mutation. And they say, what did you hear about it? And then there are groups that form together. And there's all this social network working going on around you know the particular uh, mutations that people have and um, Facebook this, group for mutants there's yeah. all kinds of Facebook so groups for mutants, all kinds well. of Google places and and all of this information is oh today we know that this gene is involved in this but oh guess what I also heard it's involved in fertility so maybe that's why and you know next thing you know there's you know some explanations. But based on your reporting of all of this how much of any of that is accurate I think that nobody knows huh. I think that no one knows. Everyone says, yes, there have been these studies, and this gene is associated with this, and it's also associated with this, but what this gene actually does is unclear right now. Well, maybe I can jump in yeah. on this respectfully. I mean, yeah. everything you're saying is true, but it's when you t you're talking about things in general terms. But in fact, I can tell you in the teaching hospitals in Toronto, um, uh, physician scientists are using this information every day. They're moving gently into doing whole genome microarrays or sequencing, but they're using gene-specific tests to help uh, diagnose disease, make predictive decisions of what medications should be used, and I'm consulted all the time on these types of things. So it is happening. You need to be aware of that, but only for certain um, diseases that have been well studied. Can you based use on for research. instance? Cystic fibrosis, many of the cancers, for example, cardiac disease, I mean anything you can think of, neuropsychiatric disorders. And uh, a little secret from the field is, uh, and, and this is coming because of genome sequencing, um, in a way, studies have been conducted in the past looking for certain types of genetic variants, what we call common genetic variants, the genetic variants that accumulated through uh, human history. Um, and for many diseases, um, that's not the cause. It's actually these rare genetic variants, new mutations that may have accumulated early um, in your own development or perhaps a few generations ago. And, and the genome sequencing technology allows us to detect those in a much more robust manner than the previous technology. So what we're when we're starting to see the impact, it's just coming the last, I'd say, 24 months. It's because we have the technology now. Now, is it entirely predictive? It may say you're going to develop a neuropsychiatric disorder. You can't say it's autism or schizophrenia or a certain type of cancer. But it's going to either be used in a confirmatory way after you present with, with a particular disorder uh, or, in some cases, as we get better and better, understanding the information at population level in a predictive way. But and we you, will assign some statistics to these. It's already happening. Okay? But when you have that information, yeah. what do you then do with it? Well, it depends on your life stage. depends who you are. You may share it with your, your children at some point. It may modify the treatment you're taking. It may actually uh, it may influence you to change your lifestyle or it may not. Uh, I think it depends on how that's delivered to you. And I think setting up the systems to to educate the, the, the physicians, for example, or the uh, healthcare workers and the population that they should be using this information in a beneficial way. Uh, I, I make recommendations of changing your lifestyle is very, very important. So it's, it's you know, again, part of this project was to, to get the whole process out there and get people thinking about how they can use this in a positive way and be aware of what the, perhaps the negative aspects mm -hmm. of the 
Ed, did you want to weigh in on that? Just about personalized medicine. So you were referring to personalized medicine, and I, I, I think that's, yes. and, and, and that's, that's critically important. But we, we all, I think, know the benefits, even though genetic testing now probably offers more questions than answers. It's a great road to go down, and we know the benefits of it, but we also have to truly understand that uh, science is outperforming legislation. Mm -hmm. And, and we need to understand and people need to understand that they, it's a personal choice and they need to protect themselves. And we also probably at this point need government to stand in and protect mm -hmm. so that we can truly benefit going forward from the Genome Project because okay. there's benefit there. But, Carolyn, I don't know if you've followed this angle of it much, but it takes a long time to get anything passed. Even in a majority <laughs> government in Ottawa, it takes a long th time to, yeah, you know, you've got task forces, you've got legislative hearings, you've got... First, second, third, fourth reading, royal. I mean, it takes a while. Uh, Technology is always going to be ahead of our political and legislative ability to catch up, isn't it? In which case, what do it, you do? Well, I think one of the interesting aspects, I've, I mean, I've often looked at this situation before the DNA Dilemma series that ran in December, and I wondered, why does the United States have GINA? Why do all these other countries have, you know, they, they you know, the, which, means? which is their, basically, it is their massive piece of legislation that protects um, individuals against discrimination based on what's in their DNA, from insurance and employment, um, you know, that you, you wouldn't be able to keep your job because they find out you're at high risk of, of depression, say, or, or something like that. Um, where you couldn't uh, get um, insurance because you, your family has a, a high risk of, of, of Huntington's or, or whatever the, 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 um, the disease is in question. And why does Canada not have this? And it's interesting talking to people about this because some people feel Canada doesn't really need it because we have a public health system and so you're never going to be turned away based on what's in your genes. And other people feel that well, we still need it because you can be denied life insurance because of it. And uh, uh, there's nothing to prevent an insurance company from coming to you and saying, did you have a DNA test? And really, well, what were the results of those DNA, that DNA test? And mm. may I see uh, the results? And may I take a look? And then, you know, that they would go away and cross-reference, you know, the mutations or, that were found with, you know, what is known and decide that you're at high risk and they'll either, you know, jack up your premiums or deny you life insurance completely. Mm -hmm. And there, and some people are really split, even bioethicists and experts mm -hmm. are, are very split on this in Canada. Perhaps that's fair. Insurance companies, that, that's a business and that's what they're in the business of doing is assessing risk. Which is why we don't have legislation and, here. And mm -hmm. that's why there hasn't been, I think, uh, a great will to push this forward here. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me put, uh, we're down to less than 10 minutes to go here, and I want to try one new issue on the table and get everybody to weigh in. Carrie, how about you first? What, what happens when you undergo a genomic test, you find something you weren't looking for or you weren't told to look for, but you think the patient maybe would want to or ought to want to know about that information? Then what? Well, I'm going to back that up. If we do consent very well, then in theory, and, and Stephen might want to comment on this with his project, in theory you would say if we find something that we weren't looking for, that we're not completely clear of, would you want to know about that? Um, the problem with that is they could say, for instance, and we don't do a great job of saying what that could be, mm -hmm. but you know, Consent is going to have to be much more nuanced and layered than we are normally accustomed to, already is, in which we've got to have all kinds of parameters to consent. But, you know, generally we have to know whether a person would want additional information if it's something they're not looking for ahead of time. You know, what about their families, though? What if you find something that has an incredibly powerful family link? The ethical question is, does the physician have an obligation to notify others? In public health issues like you know infectious diseases, we absolutely have a legal and ethical obligation to move past the individual to others. Does that extend itself into genetics? Most of the consent structure is 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 protected to the individual, but it's still an open question in ethics whether we have an, an obligation to those that are also affected by the genetic similarity to other people within the family. Let me get Laura and then Stephen on this. Laura, go ahead. How would you weigh in on this? Uh, well, I mean, yeah, if, if something comes up, of course, your, your hope is that you have some sense in advance of patient preferences. 
Um, if you don't, um, you know, I've been through this as a process. You have to weigh um, the level of risk involved with the information, um, whatever sense you have about whether or not they would want it. Um, big question is whether there's anything. If it changes medical treatment, then I think most people would come down on the side of saying, like, look, we have to give this information if it's going to make a difference. If it doesn't make a difference in medical treatment, it's a much harder call. Um, in terms of other family members, um, I don't know about Canada. The law here, um, it's, it's not set, it's not set in stone, but the precedents that we have um, suggest that there is an obligation to warn at-risk family members in general uh, of, a, of a serious foreseeable threat, but that that warning can take the form of warning the patient in front of you uh, rather than seeking out people. So it doesn't kind of create an obligation for whoever does the test, the medical um, caregiver, to seek out and find everyone who could be affected. But to give that information to their patient and suggest that it be transmitted to family members, it has gone that far. At least that's what it is here. Okay. Stephen Chair? Well, so I think most of the comments were based on research studies looking at specific diseases. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's important to point out when you do this test, we may be studying disease A, and then you scan the whole genome, you're actually, the probability of finding something relevant, uh, clinically relevant, for something else other than disease A is much higher than finding disease A. <laughs> yeah. okay. That's what we're seeing. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what we're seeing. That's the complicating factor. But then if you translate that into the, the hospital setting, when genome sequencing becomes a standard tool, when you come into the, the hospital emergency ward and they don't know what's wrong, they're going to take your saliva, your blood, and sequence your DNA, and you're going to wait, and they're going to come back, mm -hmm. and they're going to say, okay, this might explain why you feel sick now, but we also found that you're at very high risk to developing colon cancer. Um, so if you go to your doctor and you have a stubbed toe and he kind of examines you and finds a tumor, I mean, they're obligated to tell you, right, mm -hmm. explain to you why. So I don't see why it's any different. I think the difference here we've been talking about is a research study versus what's going to happen in a clinical or a hospital setting going forward. Uh, they're going to use the information that's going to benefit the family, and it's going to be of different forms. In some cases, it's going to be entirely predictive, like Huntington's. Mm -hmm. If there's no family history, you can still have Huntington's. It could yeah. be a new mutation. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, or Alzheimer's or cystic fibrosis or whatever it is. So when you have your genome sequenced, it's providing information, uh, very powerful information on your past, your present, and your future. And the predictive nature really depends on how good we do our science, I think. So that's why we want to do the project. Last minute, Carolyn. <laughs> Sir, I, this, this reminds me of actually I, I heard from Cheryl Schumann who was talking about some of these ethical challenges and consent and how you try to anticipate what might happen. <laughs> And one of the scenarios, the hypothetical scenarios that they were talking about was what if you sequence a child and you find out that the child carries um, one of the mutations, say BRCA1 or BRCA2, involved in breast cancer. Breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And you know now that child inherited it from one of the parents. Mm -hmm. Do you tell? Um, and what would, you know, the, the parent was never the patient here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for the child, um, maybe the, the clinical relevance is not immediate, but if you don't tell the parents, mm -hmm. and there is perhaps you know, a course of action to be taken, mm -hmm. then are you in fact negligent by not telling, but yet the parent was never consented, and it just... Hmm. And, the parent and around and around it goes. Exactly. Yeah. I, w I want to thank all of you for coming on the program today and just resolving all of these issues to everybody's <laughs> satisfaction. <laughs> Look at his split. We got it all done. That's great. <laughs> Laura Hersher, it was good of you to join us. On the line from New York City, the genetic counselor instructor from Sarah Lawrence College. Thanks so much for being there in the Big Apple for us. Dr. Stephen Scher, the director of the Center for Applied Genomics at the Hospital for Sick Kids here in Toronto. Dr. Kerry Bowman, the bioethicist at the Joint Center for Bioethics at U of T. Bev Heims Myers, Heim Myers, excuse me, chair of the Canadian Coalition for Genetic Fairness, and Carolyn Abraham, whom we look forward to having back in the months ahead uh, to talk more directly about her new book, The Juggler's Children, A Journey into Family, Legend, and the Genes That Bind Us. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.